Real quick, before we get into the show, I wanted to share a new service called Getita that Ken and I have been using that has made us over $10,000 in Amazon reimbursements. The service requires no monthly subscription, and Getita collects a small percentage of the money they recover for you. It takes less than five minutes to set up and works on all Amazon marketplaces. Go to getita.com, G-E-T-I-D-A, and enter promo code FTM400. That's FTM for firing the man, 400, to get your first $400 in reimbursements commission free. How much money does Amazon owe you? Welcome everyone to the Firing the Man podcast, a show for anyone who wants to be their own boss. If you sit in a cubicle every day and know you are capable of more, then join us. This show will help you build a business and grow your passive income streams in just a few short hours per day. And now your hosts, serial entrepreneurs, David Schomer and Ken Wilson. Welcome, everyone, to the Firing the Man podcast. On today's episode, we have the pleasure to interview Steve Kilbert. Steve has over 20 years of online experience and in the past five years has focused specifically on e-commerce. He knows his e-com business business very well, and over a discussion at dinner one night, he grew his e-commerce business into a seven-figure company. We're very much looking forward to hearing his story and learning more about e-commerce. Welcome to the show, Steve. Thank you, David. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to chat with you and Ken and your audience. Absolutely. So to start things off, can you please share with our listeners a little bit more about yourself and your background? Yeah, sure. So like a lot of us, we all have variations in our career. I'll say that. And uh, I got into the uh, internet space about 20 plus years ago, just over 20 years ago, and worked in different companies in the internet space. And after my last job separation, my parents were having some issues. So I needed some flexibility. And I started off doing some consulting and just helping some different businesses out through relationships and enjoyed that, but just wasn't quite working for me. So then I evolved into doing some e-commerce because I had some friends doing that and they were having some good success. And so I said to my wife, look, I'll give this a try. If I can't be working six months, I'll go get a job. And she said, okay, you know, good luck. And so while we didn't quite turn the corner that I would say in the six months, I had enough momentum then to say, wait a second, there's something here. So, you know, kind of kept going and, you know, as any, as any person who starts a business will, will tell you, as you guys know as well, it's not a straight line. <laughs> there's a lot of ups and downs and sideways and backwards, unfortunately. And uh, long story short, yeah, we grew it to seven figures. Now, unfortunately, COVID rushed our business. But that being said, as I know how all this works, and so we're in the process of building a backup. But in lieu of that, because we were at a point we were about, to, I linked up with a colleague of mine who had a bunch of deals. He was trying to help buy his businesses on taking them across that line to have that exit experience. So we were going to do that. I never forget this conversation with my wife as we were having dinner. And I said, well, if we sell this thing, we can get this. Not going to be a home run, but we could do okay. You know, just It'd be, it'd be a great experience to start an idea and sell it. I made the decision not to. I do this and this. We could double this thing or trip. And then some things didn't work out. Anyway, it's been a it's been a wild journey. And now that I'm doing a little bit of M and A advising, see behind the scenes with a lot of different businesses, which are e-commerce or even SaaS businesses. But we've got a number of e-commerce businesses. So for me, it's been utterly fascinating because I get to see the financials and then I see the business model. I'll ask them four questions on what they're doing and growing, what what got them to where they're at, and of course, why are they selling and there's some common themes, which I think your listeners will, will hopefully find valuable to get in. There really is a pattern of people of what they're not doing. It's really jaw-dropping some of the things that they're just leaving on the table. And the, the point is, if you're going to sell your asset, you want to get the most money because they're not doing some very, I call simple things. They end up leaving a lot of money on the table and they get frustrated a lot. Of, not all of them, but sometimes they get frustrated because of course they want, and the marketplace will say that the valuation is really worth this, the accepting it bond. So that's the thing that's been really, really to me. It's just learning those lessons, starting it for myself, very seven figures, having the setback and now knowing what to do to grow back up and now seeing other businesses that are different. Like you can talk about skincare, any kind of e-commerce, Commerce business, we've dealt with a number of, and it's just, it doesn't matter because at the end of the day, it's just a widget. I say this not to insult people, but it's a widget. But at the end of the day, it's it's math and it's just a business model. Like, how to your product has to solve a problem for the marketplace. 
that somebody has a need for something. And big into a little bit is my wife and I were in the fitness, that's my wife's marathon winner. So we were selling fitness accessories. Nothing crazy. It was very big. It was very competitive. Probably looking back, I think the wrong products to sell, but we made it work. But that allowed me to really dig into the business and understand how it works. Again, we were solving a need in the market. It was doing it at a competitive price and we just made it work. I knew how to drive traffic. One thing that was really, really hit home with me as we're going through our journey is having dinner and we had some, we had some relatives and they had the news on or the TV on the background. And then this was now prime time television, one of our top Probably, yeah. It's not our top competitor. One of our top was running a television ad in primetime TV. And it just hit me like, wow, wait a minute. They're selling some of the same products we are. And yet we will never run television ads because I know how this working. Yet we're still able to capture a fraction of the market share. Very, very, very small, but it didn't matter because it evolved. So long answer to your question, but hopefully that gives you a little bit of back kind of where I got to it. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for sharing all that, Steve. And, and it, you've been in the, uh, the space for a really long time. Now you're getting in more into the M&A and kind of peeking behind the curtain. So you've got a lot, a ton of knowledge, excited to kind of dig into some of these questions and, and share with the listeners. And so first one is um, you made you made a comment and you had said like, there's a lot of things that, you know, specifically e-commerce, a lot of things, e-commerce businesses, they're not doing. So can you kind of go over a few of those just to kind of share like, what are what are the things that you see that that um, business owners are not doing that they should be doing? Yeah, there's, a, there's, there's really a couple of core things I see. This is a pattern over and over again that when we work with e-commerce businesses or even other businesses, but it, uh, let's talk about e-commerce here. This is the one that I know dear, dear. And it just shocks me that people don't don't know. They don't know their number. And what I mean by that is I'll ask them four key questions I'll ask every business owner and this really applies. What is your cost to generate a lead? And a lead is defined as an email and or a phone number. How can you communicate? somebody and that some or a direct communication. What is your cost to acquire a lead? And let's say email conversation. They don't know the answer to that question. They should know it down. And I knew that. I knew the answer. Then what is your cost to acquire a customer? The second question. The third question, a lot of them will know is like, what is your average transaction value when a new customer comes on board? And they'll pretty, pretty much have it. So whether they're using Shopify or e-commerce or big commerce, any of the any of the e-commerce platform out there, they'll pretty much have a good idea of that. But the last number that they don't know is to me is arguably the most important question. Is what is your lifetime value for your customer? And they just don't know. And I literally have to st- stop and ask them over and over again, well, how did you get this far? And they like, well, we just keep growing, we get customers, and you know, we're making it work. And it's like, wow, but they don't realize what they're leaving with tail because they don't know that now. And why that's so pivotal or so important is that if you know, let's use e commerce example, your lifetime value is 100. It was a client I was consulting last year. She had no idea. She said it was skincare. Her lifetime value per customer was seven hundred fifty dollars. She had no idea, and she didn't know. How, and she also didn't know what it cost her for a lead or her cost her for a customer. She just happened to get it, and it just grew. And nothing against her; she was more of a specialist, not a, a marketer, not an e-com. And so I tried to I showed her that okay, we can acquire customers. You could literally spend up five hundred dollars to acquire a customer, even six hundred dollars, and still make this work. But obviously, you don't want to spend that. You don't need to. Don't have to in the online space because there's plenty of uh, ways to get trapped or acquire customers. Were way less. But it was one of those things it took her a while to really grasp that. So I finally showed her like numbers together. Yeah, well, no, eventually she did. But again, then you run into work out all those types of things, which is another challenge you have in e commerce. But that's one of the most knowing your numbers. A little bit of a long answer. The next thing that I would say is equally as important, if not more of a foundational thing, is they don't know their avatar ideal customer profile. ICP is another actor that's out there and a very, very deep. And what I mean by our e-commerce business, we knew our ideal buyer was a 47-year-old female that lived outside of Houston, Texas, in a major, you could say major metropolitan area, but I knew it was Houston, Texas. They were married, college educated, worked in the medical field. I had to be more specific. She was a nurse, drove an SUV, had a child, and owned an iPhone. Now, how the heck did I know all this stuff? Well, I just looked at all the data and I could actually keep going. I knew what restaurant she went to. I know what she liked travel, I knew what magazines she read. All that stuff is out there, but people don't know where to look. And the reason that that's important, that could identify, and now again, we did sell the mails, we sold the people that you know, older and younger, but that was our singular person. I, mean, I know you guys have heard this, but you have to sell the one person. When you really identify that one person, that level of deep to just described, it allows you to articulate your marketing in a much different way that you can use your email communications or you can identify those pain points that your ideal customer is experiencing, which is going to resonate with them because they're going to feel that, wow, this ad or this this brand is talking to me directly. We're the little guy. We're the small mom and pop business. So this is how we're able to heat up. I really got into this as we got down the road is once I understood all those those details that you realize it's the same for everything. It doesn't matter. But going back to your question of 
one of the core things people don't know is they don't know their average. Child. They'll say it's, oh, it's females over 45. It's like, that's too generic. You have to get really, really granular so you know what their pain points are. Because the other thing is that as you grow your business, you're going to want, you're going to want to leverage how you serve. And by knowing all these details about, it, you can then offer them other products and services that you can deliver or even affiliate on. And that's the stuff where people end up leaving money at the tape, not leveraging their assets. And the, maybe the third thing I will say is they don't, <laughs> they don't email their list enough. I know a lot. I don't want to spam people. I don't want people to go out and subscribe. It's like, but that's an asset of your business that you built up and you don't leverage. And it's mind numbing to me because it's literally money that's sitting right at people and they just choose not to, to do it. It's a lot of work to create the content. I get it. Now we're like I just said, you know, all those, you can create all that content. And now with artificial intelligence, it's so easy. It's, it is literally especially now, Hopefully that gives you enough of it for at least some detail. I could keep going, but that, I've got some a quick follow-ups before I kick it over to David. And I guess for, for the list, if they if they don't know these numbers, lifetime value, cost of acquisition, where can they where, where do you find are those readily available? Do you have to calculate them on a spreadsheet? Where can they go and get these numbers? And then also avatar. How can how can someone figure out like you went into minute detail on this on this where you, where your avatar is eating dinner, like in which magazines they're reading? And so how do you how do you filter that out? Yeah, no, it's a great there's two great questions. Ken. So let me use the first one out the uh, that number is right. Really, whatever your e-commerce platform is, it's going to have, you're going to have to download it. Uh, there's software now that you can actually, you know, it's going to be a cost with it, but it goes back to, you see the value in that, which I would argue is if you're growing your business, I want to grow this, but I know a lot of people are at that level. So you can just do it on a spreadsheet. We were going, I did it on a spreadsheet. It was a little painful. I had monstrous spreadsheet set up because there was a really software that's available in Marketplace today. Either I, I just was on, but this was, you know, in the last few years, I've really now opened my eyes up to other things that are out there, but it was on a spreadsheet. You can do this. It's not that hard. Again, just download all your customer data. And so an easy way to figure this out is just look at all of your, whatever your, your email platform is, even in Shopify, because people are going to, they're going to sign up. This is how that happens is that people will, we've all done this. You go, you add the card, you get, you get distracted and you, and so you need to email those people afterwards. I don't want, yeah, well, we did that. And I'll ask, I'll say, well, how many emails do you send them with a bandy cart? And that first question is a lot of people don't even do that. Fine. We can sell. But if they do, if they do, they'll say, I sent one or two emails. I'm like, well, you should send a few more because you'd be surprised after the fourth and fifth email that people will actually click that link and go by. And I knew this, uh, but they don't email their list. And so, but if you're looking at their, whatever their CRM is, they should, even if it's Shopify or whatever there is, they're going to have a list of time. Download all that because you'll have a list of buyers and, and people who are not buyers subscribers if you and then just do the math on a time period of either i look at six to 12 to 18 months for that lifetime value you can go longer but that's going to give you a good rule of thumb at least uh, or even two years and just divide out the numbers like okay all these sales i made and just divide that number nah, it's really not that hard to do and yet people don't take the time to do that oh my lord but that's the stuff that we're also overwhelmed with our business and to answer your question on the avatar there are various tools out there again you can take your email list you can upload it to searches and you can then like uh, uh take a check but you can check out different things you want and then we'll then match on what does it have on these email addresses their database and we'll spit you back here's all this demographic profile that you choose to do i mean you're gonna pretty much know the uh the demographic i mean the, the gender but you're gonna want to maybe look at age you can look at the income level as well i mean these are different things that are out there that's one thing it's a paid service but you can also look at some other tools that are out there that are free of charge now facebook has made some changes to platform which you can see now like Fan page. But that was one of our sources early on because I don't know if you guys would call a few years back and your fan page, you looked in the analytics, it sure would give you so many details. And one of the things we learned about our avatar was that they also like country music. I was like, I would never have had an idea of that. So one time we were trying to test some different ads out. I said, okay, well, they, Facebook is telling us that our, our, all of our fans, which is yeah, just generalizing, but it's still, they like country music. So I ran some ads just targeting country music and lo and behold, it works. But I was like, okay, I get it, right? But there's other tools that are out there. Some are free and smart paid, but it's one of those things that to me, it's beneficial for you to try to get that data. Now, the other way is also easy. You just survey them and ask them. Oh, people don't even do that. Either get on the phone and talk to people, that is just going to blow your mind, which you'll learn. I know a lot of people are afraid to do that, but it's, you really should be trying to talk to your customer. They will appreciate it or just survey them. And there's all these free tools out there, whether it's a Google form or something, just send traffic to that and just ask them a series of questions. Ideally, your, your email CRM should be able to do that as well, because you don't want to tie whatever questions your app and the answer provided to that because it'll start to build up in your date, right? So let's just say, for example, 
we are in fitness and so if weight loss was something i just is very generic because fitness and weight loss are tied together if we said all right have you ever tried to lose weight and, all, and, and that was a radio box and they checked yes and that then we would identify that to that specific person and over time you'd bump that up to people and say okay this amount of people so i can now send those let's say 100 people that i've identified say a round number i can send a specific email to those 100 people and they're going to be more likely to open the email and or do something with that if i make them the right offer but because they told us they've raise their hand and told us, I'm looking for this, right? Or I need help with this. And that's the stuff you have to dig to learn more about track. Very nice. I, I, I really, I like those metrics. And as we were going through those, there were certainly some that I think as we operate our own businesses, we, we have some room to sharpen our sword. You had mentioned the AI and how that is kind of changing things completely. And so it'll be fun to see those tools continue to develop and, and give us business owners more and more information. So now moving on, Steve, what would be advice you would give to somebody who is struggling with growth? Maybe they've had a business for a couple of years and have plateaued. Maybe they're just getting started and, and are trying to get those, you know, some consistent sales. What what advice would you give them? Well, they're the going back to, let me answer the second part of your question first, if they're just getting started. Here's one piece of advice that I tell a lot of people that ask me the question as we had our success is pick something you have not sell of an interest. It doesn't have to be your passion in life, but you should have some interest because here's what happens is I see this time and time again. People will come in and say, I can sell a bunch of money selling this widget. And I'm like, but do you like that widget? Let's just use fishing, for example. Nothing against fishing. A lot of fish around there, a lot of money in fishing. <laughs> but if you're not an interest fisher, I can, t- I can guarantee you between now and the next six months, you're going to come into some challenges, some roadblocks that you just don't know because your education isn't there yet. And you're going to give up and you're going to switch. Now you're going to learn something in that six month period, but you're then going to start over in the next niche. You're going to keep starting over. And I say this from personal experience because that's what happened to me, but I see that time and time again. People get started this. They don't, they don't pick something that they have at least an interest in because it's going to motivate you to keep going. That's the reason. And going back to your other questions, if they're struggling to grow right now, it ties back to some of the stuff I just kind of went through is take a look at your business in terms of like, what are you doing to grow? Like, okay, first of all, what is your long-term goal? Do you want to build this thing up just to make a side income? Or do you want to build this asset up enough to revenue? You can sell it one day. This is the one thing I would encourage your listeners to think about it because a lot of people aren't thinking that long term, but they really should. Because there's two things that tie together. It's like anything you're starting online is, can I do it? The answer is 100. Anybody can do it. And I just got to put the time and effort and the focus in and follow the right process. And there's many ways to make this work, but you should be thinking of building an asset up to sell it one day. Whether you make $50,000, $100,000, or a million dollars, it doesn't matter. Because here's what's going to happen is life is going to change. Whatever you're working at, something's going to change in the next three to five years. You may not have the same interest in three to five years. So if you build up an asset today, you focus on growing its revenue and profitability in there, you can sell these assets. Now, this ties back to your question of if they're stuck right now, it goes back to you really need to focus on knowing your numbers. It's so many people just don't know those numbers. It's really jaw dropping to me when I talk to them now in this MA role is that you have to know those numbers because it'll let you make decisions. So back to the example I mentioned earlier with the skincare brand I was working with, their lifetime value was $750. So knowing that, I was like, man, you should be, you need to get some working capital. I understand you should have to buy products. And that's that's a challenge of e-commerce. Depends that there's, but there's, it's a solvable issue. And you should be testing out different ad platforms, whether it's still Facebook or whatever. The, there's many, many platforms you to get traffic. Then you want to build up your list. You have to email your list. And you really ask family members you're building your relationship with them. But that goes back to what I said a minute ago with the avatar. If you know all those details about your avatar and what your products and services can solve for them, they're going to be more likely to open it. And it's just math. Now, there's a lot of balls in the air that you're junk. That's how you grow a business. And it's simple. And it may, I make it sound simple. And I know it's harder because there's a lot of moving parts. But those are the things that if you knew your numbers. Are like the example, I got 750. If I know that my business had a lifetime value of $750, I would be spending thousands of dollars a day to acquire as many customers as I could. Then having the end game. So once I get to a certain spot, I'm going to sell it and instead of asset. And I want you to know how to do that. You can do it again. And that's the thing that people are telling realize about. But a lot of people don't think that it's even possible. But there are, trust me, there are so many buyers out there for e commerce businesses, even today with the market change. Saliga was during COVID a couple of years ago because the valuations were literally, they were off the charts. It was like monopoly money to some degree, but that's come back to reality. And uh, but it's still do. We've talked a lot about knowing your numbers, and curious if you have any rules of thumb as it relates to what you can source a product for versus what you can sell it for. And I think that's something that a lot of 
people getting started may get blindsided by. And so curious if, if there's any rules of thumb there. Yeah. I mean, and that's a great question. The rule of thumb is you really got to have, you have to, and this goes back to knowing your number, right? So if you're going to sell a widget, I'll give you a good example of our business. We were selling a product for $19.99, fitness accessory for 20 bucks. You could buy it on Amazon for cheaper and you could sell our competitors. Not the reason that we had our stuff on Amazon, but I didn't want to play the Amazon game because of Amazon's customer. We didn't have stuff there, but it's a race to the bottom because I know roughly what it's going to be for everybody because we're getting it. So there are a lot of unlimited tools. It depends what you're selling. So in e-commerce, a lot of a lot of businesses are unfortunately going to have to get their stuff from Asia. That's not a personal decision with how you want to do that. If you want to, that's fine. But there's, there's plenty of websites out there that will let you source those products, whether it's Alibaba, AliExpress. There's a few other ones out there that you can get those from. But again, it's going to come down the numbers. So we knew for our business, we were selling for $19.99. And yeah, I knew on my average cart transaction going through was just under $40. So it's about $38. So it was almost double, right? Not quite double. But at the same time, I knew that I cost to get my product from my factory to my warehouse $1.92. That included everything, shipping, everything. And we were, we were selling a very, so that's something your audience is going to have to look to. Now that shocks a lot of people saying, you're basically getting a product too and you're selling 20, but it's wrong with those numbers. So I'm like, yeah, because you can do that. There's a there's good margin in there, but you may have to make sure you get that cart value high enough because otherwise, if you're going to, now you got to get visibility, you need eyeballs, you need traffic to the website. You need to do that. There's plenty of ways to do that. But if you run a traffic, which is what we did, this is just one way. You can still do it for a variety of affiliate, joint ventures, all those types of things, even just SEO traffic. You're going to have to know those numbers because you have to have margin built in there so you can grow and scale that business. Even if you're doing it as on the side, you have to have margin built in. And so that was the number that I looked at. And I even then 20, I would take 20 now just as a loss leader to get on the door, but you have to make money that's tied back to life. You really have to know what other products you can sell your customers, whether it's in e-commerce, it's typically more of the same. So if I just bought one widget, typically the next upsell would be, would you like to buy two more for this discount? You're not going to see this elsewhere. And that's what we did. So then they're buying multi pack in there, and that's what pulled that card value up. And then you can get that lifetime value up. That's really where you can make it. So it depends on the niche that they're involved in. But that's the other thing that people don't realize using in a e commerce and whatever platform you're using, there's, there's tools out there that will let you do this. But you have to do upsells after your initial purchase. You can do upsells pre post, pre purchase, and, and upsells post purchase. A lot of people I talk to are like, oh, that feels kind of scammy. I'm like, it works and it's money. <laughs> so it's up to you. Are you in business or not? Exactly. Yeah. Don't. No. Don't try to make money. All right. So, so Steve, I've got a follow-up question on two of the most important KPIs that you had mentioned, cost of acquisition and lifetime value. And so I always, I don't know why, but I always use this water bottle as an example. It's always on my desk. And so, so we've got a, we've just started a business. It's, it, we're about six months old. We sell water bottles here one size, three different colors, whatever. We know that our cost of acquisition is $10 to acquire a customer. And our lifetime value, we know after six months that on average, each one person, on average, they buy 2.5 water bottles. So the water bottle is $20. And so that'd be a $50 lifetime value. And so cost of acquisition, let's say it's 10 and $50 lifetime value. At what rate, now that we know those two numbers, that's very powerful, right? And so what rate would you advise a small e-commerce business of of scaling because you had mentioned earlier cash flow is always a problem and so there's a, a rate that's too much it'll it'll bankrupt the company and then there's a rate that you won't grow fast enough to to um, capitalize on market share so what rate would you do you recommend to grow that's a great question so the other number you can wait is what's the cost of the product right so just make up a number on your water bottle there let's say it's two dollars and fifty cents Sure. I even say $3. Okay. So let's just say $2.50. Now we know $12.50 is the cost for everything. Now you have to shipping in there. So now it comes down to, do you charge for shipping or do you absorb the shipping cost? So this is what's on a spreadsheet. You literally put it, ship, put on every column in there, what those cost numbers are. Right. So then if you wait, like if you, instead of you said people buy two and a half, right? So if they happen to buy two up front, well, there's, that's a different weight. So you need to factor all those numbers. And I know it seems, it seems a little bit overkill, but it's not. You need to know those numbers because you want to try to get as close to the nearest, especially for an item that's small like that, as close to the nearest penny possible. Now, again, you can always round up to the nearest dime or quarter, but that's going to allow you to then know what your your real numbers are. So in that example of $50, and you have now, let's just say, let's say $15 worth shipping and everything for the sake of this conversation. So you have $35 left over. That is basically profit that point. If your customer, if your customer acquisition is $10 and your shipping and everything else is five bucks, so you have $35 in profit. So now 
I would recommend, and again, this is the way I've done things because I've learned it. I've run paid traffic just to turn that volume out because I want to turn that inventory over as fast as possible. Use that cash flow to then buy more inventory. If you can get some additional working capital, ideally, you're going to want to try to then learn more about your avatar. Because water bottles are a great example. We're in fitness. Besides your water bottle, what else could you sell it? Like, what else do they need besides thirst quenching, that, you know, the third, you know, the keeping it cool, et cetera? Well, if they're, if they're in a water bottle, there's a chance that they might be about their health. I would think, right? Obviously, hydration is a big thing of that. Well, maybe there's some supplements you could sell somebody. You have, this goes back to why you really have to know what your avatars look for. Now, granted, they, you might think, well, they're buying it themselves. It doesn't matter. Because if you put that as you're know, not selling, you position the right way, you know where their peak points. Maybe some kind of a powdery. But there again, there's there are drop shipping services out there. It's a match one of your other questions earlier about where to source some of this stuff. There's a lot of drop shipping services out there, even the states that will allow you to do that, whether it's supplements or powder or whatever that is, you add that. Now, it may come from a different location, but that's okay. Some of the places will have it all in the house, but just got to communicate like that's the customer. We've all experienced that. It's like I placed an order and I got two different packages. Why is it? Well, at the end of the day, I got orders. And that's one of the things I would look at. But if, if those are the numbers in the business that you had, I would be very encouraged. $35 profit is pretty darn good. That you can start to scale that and really got to just manage that working capital. So that's where a spreadsheet comes in and say, okay, at least I'll start running the numbers. If I have a thousand of these inventory and then you expect, okay, how long does it take me to get it when I place an order into my work? And I'm assuming I'm shipping it, right? Or if it's out of my home or if it's a third party at 3 PL. And those are the things that I had to factor in. So that became a challenge for our business to give you some specifics. In 2018, we were humming along and we were spending live. And my first start spending $20 a day on ads. There was no way I would do that. Well, we were spending $2,000 a day because we had everything done. In. And I was frustrated because I realized one day, I'm like, wait a minute, I don't have so much inventory. And I knew that it was four to five weeks of time. Place the order is in my warehouse. I'm like, oh, darn it. I have to slow my spend. I had to turn my spend down. It was killing me because we were just printing money. That's a challenge. You have to really monitor all those dials and try to realize, okay, if I spend it, this continues. I'm going to sell so much. If I'm spending so much per day and I keep this pattern working through, what am I going to run out? How does it take to replace that? And so those are the things you have to kind of figure out. But any business owner should know those. Things. Great uh, follow up. And I like where you said you were printing money. Money at that point, that's a that's an entrepreneur's dream, right? Print, yeah. Turning a dial on printing money, and so so it's a just as a quick wrap up on that. Essentially, uh, your advice is it's basically a cash flow question, and so run the numbers: how much inventory do you have? How much is how long is it going to last? And when can you get more based on your cash flow? And then and then scale up based on your kind of like I call it like behind the scenes, right? Yeah, no, you really and that goes back to just, you can use a spreadsheet for all this stuff. And I know the other thing when I talk to, to business owners and I ask them those numbers, they go, "I don't do that. I don't base their skin." I know a lot of people saying that. Right. And I'm like, you better learn. But again, I think people get so like overwhelmed that begin to use calculus. It's like now we're talking basically simple. You were talking addition, some multiplication, <laughs> division. It's pretty straight, straightforward stuff. Absolutely. So continuing on a seller's journey, right? So we've we've launched a successful product, we've got customers, and maybe we're thinking about selling. So what are some things, say six months to a year out from a sale, that somebody should be doing to ensure that that sale goes? smoothly? A great question. Well, this ties back to uh, knowing your numbers. That really comes back to having your financials tightly buttoned up. Uh, don't have things all over the place. Ideally, use a service like Quick, QuickBooks or Zero, things like that, and that are going to be audited with, by your CPA or a professional account because the more that stuff is organized, the more appealing it is to buyers. I can't tell you anything that we come across anytime those people will say, well, here's my bank statements. It's like, well, that's going to allow us, we have to do a lot of work to duct tape this together and us create some financials, which we'll do because at the end of the day, the numbers have to match, right? So if you choose to sell your asset, let's say you're going to try to sell a quarter million dollars, $250,000, and it's based on the profit that the business has generated based on the financials, the bank statements are going to have to match up. So if you're saying we have so many deposits that came in because if you're doing e-commerce, you're getting deposits every day through your Stripe or whatever payment processor you're using, you're getting deposits every day to make sure you're making sales every day. At the end of the month, that's match up to your financial. doesn't think about this from a buyer perspective. What's the first thing that's going to come to mind? I don't believe you. <laughs> right? The other thing that I would, I would stress to people is try to have as many SOPs, standard operating procedures in place as possible. Mistake we made early on, well, but I learned this. The more you have that, the more the reason the support is financials and the SOPs bottled up and organized really tight is that's going to be more valuable to a buyer because they don't really create all that stuff. Because what's going to happen, I'll tell you right now, we've had this happen. 
for e-collar businesses. We've got ones that are very incredibly efficient. There's some people like, well, I've learned a lot of stuff. And others that are kind of a mess. And they come in, the buyer goes, okay, you asked for this, but let's say 250 Maybe the financial support it, but typically it's going to be a little bit high. But now that I got to do all this and this, okay, my offer is going to be 175 And so now you get into negotiating. So now the owner is frustrated. Like, I want 250 You know, your your financials are a little bit, I'm not quite sure. And I because I can't be confident in those that I have to discount that down because you don't have any standard operating procedures. I have to further discount that down. And so now a savvy buyer will be free to start to, as you would be as a buyer. If you're coming out, I want to buy something out of this. And that's the other thing that I see time and time again is these business owners because they're not they're not entrepreneurs. They're specialists in their fields. They started it. And they, have the, they don't have these things in place. And so then the, the valuation business gets dinged and then they end up having to, if they want to sell. And most of them are at the point where they're burned out, they're exhausted, they're frustrated, or they're just don't know what, you know, they don't, they've lost faith in the future of their business. And it's just because they don't know a lot of these things because there's a lot of parts. And so they end up selling. And so they wanted the 250 and end up selling, say, for 170 or even 150 at times. That's, and think about that. That's, that's anywhere from 75 to 100,000 dollars. That's a lot of money. The other thing I would encourage your, your listeners in this regard is don't think you're going to build the next say Twitter, but let's say e-commerce business. You're not going to build the next Amazon. It's not going to happen. Don't worry about it. But I will tell you, as I did this with our business, and I've seen this now with other businesses, so I'm doing this happening. You can still build the e-commerce business and still sell it and have a nice, healthy profit where you can actually go and buy a house. I've experienced it. And once you know how to do that, once you take in that business to that level, it is so liberating to know how all that works because now you know how it works and you can choose then to go and do it again if you want because there's enough businesses out there that are not running as efficiently as you would think. The stuff that I just described during the podcast here, and there's plenty out there. And a lot of these business owners are frustrated, they're burnt out. And a lot of things they just don't know, they don't know. So I feel for them in many aspects. It's, it's painful as well that they they don't do some simple things. And one more point to the you know getting your to answer your questions. I said this earlier about emailing your listing, creating that relationship. The thing that I come across time and time again is I'll ask, okay, how big is your list? It's 10,000, 20,000. Like, great. Okay, we're an e commerce business. This is something I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but hopefully your listeners will take the value in this. So whatever your list size is, even if it's 1,000, it doesn't matter. Your list size should be generating you $1 in revenue per month. For your business. So do the math. If you have a list of 10000 that's $120,000 in revenue. If you're not generating that, then that tells me you don't know enough about your avatar and or you're not emailing them enough with products and services. And if you say, well, I have an e-commerce business. I only have like four or five SKUs. Okay, fine. But if you know all those things about your avatar that I described earlier, all those details where there's a whole bunch of other stuff you can sell them, you could, rather than, you could recommend them through affiliate products. And there's affiliate programs out there like Commission Junction, there's a whole slew of things out there that are plenty of products that you can, you know, you can apply to these things and you can create a relationship. And like we were in fitness, so we applied to Reebok, for example. We were sending emails out, here's something, here's some shoes or here's some fitness apparel that we didn't have. Go here and buy it from the Reebok store. And they would, and then we'd get a commission on it. You've mentioned affiliates a couple of times, and I'd like to dive into that just yeah. for our listeners who may not be familiar with that. So first, what exactly is that? And the second follow-up question would be, how are you using that? Great question. Thanks for asking. I, a lot of times I forget. So it's second nature to me. So basically as an affiliate, now you can run that, you can actually create an affiliate program for your business, but I, I wouldn't recommend people start out with that. There's there's a lot of work involved in that too, to get it up and running, right? Maybe down the road, you can do that. Basically a business will only will pay you a commission or a, however they define the end goal, which in the e-commerce space, it's typically a purchase. A lot of times they'll pay per lead, which means you send traffic from your list, your website, your funnel, whatever that is, and you send it to somebody else. If somebody takes action, and they will pay you a commission for that. It's all performance based. So that advertiser, let's use Reebok as an example, because I we have promoted some of their stuff because you know it was just the easy thing that we did. I applied to it, got got it accepted, and I'm like, okay, great, let's just do this every every once. I would take our email list, and we would create some copy, and because we knew enough about our avatar, and then we would say, hey, if you'd like to get a discount on some of these other apparel, go here to the Reebok store. And by the way, those affiliate, those business owners will give you a discount code, ten percent, twenty percent more. You could say, use this code when you go to check out. I've got a special deal with this big advertiser, but I'm going to give it to you, my customer. You can get a 20% discount if you go here and buy this, use this code. So now the email, they click, they go to that store, they get to the checkout, and they put the code in that customer, which is my customer, but I'm now giving them away. We'll get a discount on 20% of an example. And yet now 
Reebok, in that example, has a new customer or maybe a current customer, but they've got them as a new, they made a new purchase from me. They're willing to pay me a commission. And that's how this works. It's you're getting paid a performance commission. And depending on the niche you're in, I can guarantee you there are plenty of affiliate programs and services out there, whether it's an e-commerce program or even a service program or a kind of a coaching offer or a variety of information products. Those are the ones that pay more is the information products. And pretty much any net, you can find an information products and those are much more better. Then, or then you can do to take that a step further is once you start doing this, you're like, wait a minute, I'm driving traffic for this. Let's say it's an information product about, so and let's just use fitness as an example about a, some kind of a weight loss or stretching, whatever it is. Now, I may not be a stretching expert. I can go hire somebody to create a program. And then I guess what I can promote my own program, which is then going to increase my lifetime value. It's going to make my business more value. Very nice. Very nice. And Ken, you had something you wanted to follow up with. So Steve, on the, the piece of the email size, so was it $1 per subscriber you have? Should be You should be generating $1 of revenue per subscriber. So if you have a 10000 uh-huh. Per month. Per month. Yes. So 10,000 emails on your list, you should be generating about $10,000 per month in revenue. That is correct. That is a rule of thumb. If it's less, then you're like, okay, let's say it's 50 cents. Okay, great. I got revenue coming in. But knowing that the average in the industry for people that know what they're doing is about a dollar per dollar. So, okay, what else can I do so, so I can get to that dollar level? Well, I got to email my list more frequently. I got to get to know them. I got to build a relationship with them. This is this is really, when you think about this, you're building an asset. And a lot of people I have to get over the mindset of, well, I'm not, I'm not Reebok. I can't compete with them. You're not going to compete with them. It doesn't matter. People still want to work with small mom and top top businesses. That's when it came out of COVID is that people really want to look at it. And they still will do that. If you know what their pain points are, if you can present, you can solve that for them and you're doing it at a competitive price, people will take that risk. Now, not everybody does. That's okay. The math will work. If that was a belief that I do, you know, I'm thinking, how the heck am I going to start this thing? Who's going to buy this widget? There's no way. And then once I started selling, you're like, wait a minute. And then it becomes an internal belief. You start to realize, so wait a second, this is just, it doesn't matter what the product is. It's kind of a side story, but I think it's related here when we were growing our business. Like back to the Mike's story I said earlier about one of our top competitors was running television ads. My wife and I happened to go to Asia for a trade show and we were walking this trade show and we saw this competitor actually. And they're like, oh, would you like this to produce your products? And we're like, wait, you guys do that? They're like, yeah, we actually manufactured that product. Now our our supplier was a different manufacturing unit, but it's the same product. All the difference was the box was different the other day. It was the same. That was like one of those moments. Oh my Lord, now the material was different. I could get the exact same thing if I wanted to and just put a different box in it. That was another huge revelation. So a little bit off tangent, but I think it may tie back to some stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Getting back to um, exits and, and and selling a business, you know, David asked you earlier, like, what can, what can we do to prep? And you kind of went through some of that stuff. Now, when you get close to it now, do you recommend using a broker? Do you want, do you recommend selling it yourself? Like how, what does that look like? And, and what is your advice? In the past, would have said, don't use broker. They're terrible. Now, there are some real, there are sadly some poor ones out there, but there are some good ones. And now that I'm providing more of a service because I know how this stuff works, I look at it as try to source one out that's going to help you and really be that advisor for you because there's a lot of things you're not going to know. Now, you don't have to do that. Be clear about that. You can use, to, there's various platforms out there that will help you to some degree. But I've also learned now being in the trenches here, they're going to provide different levels of service. They're going to tell you they're going to do everything, but it's going to be kind of cursory. So I'm not going to try, I don't want to bat them up them because they do provide a great service to a lot of these guys. Some are going to be much bigger than others, right? So there's like a, it's just a platform. Think about this as an Amazon, right? So if I want to sell my business, I can go to a online platform sell commerce business. And there's more than one. When I first got involved, I had no idea. It then I met some guys at a conference and they were one of these companies. And they told me like, oh yeah, we, when they were, they were smaller back then. I've grown to a much bigger company. But if I said the name, you guys are reference. It doesn't matter because there's multiple ones out there, but I had no idea this existed. And I was like, wait, you can sell. So that became my goal with our business. Now that I'm doing this, it's just, I'm having so much fun. It's crazy. But you can do this on your own. Just understand you be buttoned up. And the only things you're going to have to know how to do though, the other thing along those lines are, you have to sell your business. You have to sell it. You really have to have, be comfortable with sales. And that's one of the reasons why I work with a colleague now. We end up getting a lot of these businesses to come work with us because they're not salespeople. They don't know really how to communicate with people. So if that's you, one of your listeners, then I would strongly encourage you to use one of these online platforms. Or what, and this what happened with the people who were but now they tried these online platforms, but they, they're still doing all the communication and they bundle things and they would drive buyers away because they didn't know how to present their business. That's where a broker can get involved, one that knows what they're doing. You can position your business as an asset that can be sold. They handle all the negotiations. A lot of people that tie back to your question is they feel 
feel uneasy about negotiating. I understand. Think about this. It's their baby. They put all the sweat and, and, and effort into this thing, and they're going to get really defensive if somebody starts to question them. And that's one of the things that we've seen with some of our companies <laughs> we work. We have to kind of calm them down to say, I get it. But at the end of the day, your financials are, are this. It's I know you think it's worth this because you put all this money and effort into it. The business is only generating this because at the end of the day, it's a business that's generating profit and cash. And that's what someone's going to value the business at. So you have to, they get rolling, man. There's stuff, they're going to have to have some really, you know, conversations with them to kind of talk them back to reality. It's like, and the reason they keep us is because they try it on their own. They could. So then they come to us and that we, that's where I think brokers can, can provide a good value. And again, there's different ones out there, but really the same token as you go into using a broker, you have to ask them a lot of questions and how long they've been doing this. What is their process? What are they really going to do to mark your business? At the end of the day, you want to sell your asset. It is, I will say this to give you one more detail about that is it's a lot of work to sell a business. People don't realize that it becomes, and that's something that we found out as well. Doing this is that people try to sell the business and they're like, I'm trying to run the business. I don't have time to deal with all these inquiries, all this other stuff going on. And then that's where we fill that void because we'll have a lot of stuff, but it's a lot of work. There's a lot. And yeah, what like any any business processes you're going to get let's say let's say 20 people are going to say knock on the door and say let's have a conversation and 19 will go away and then you're frustrated because you're losing time now you're going to work but at the end of the day you're uh, there's so much emotion tied to this because you want to sell it and there's a variety of reasons why you're trying to sell it hopefully you're not running out of cash and burning through it but a lot of times again people are burnt out and they're overwhelmed they don't know what they don't know and so i i feel for so many of these business owners that's just that's life and that's business in general and it doesn't have to be an e-commerce business we've all we look at the marketplace right now there's plenty of public trick that are doing that are struggling right now and that ties back to all this stuff together but this is where a little guy and gal can compete with an e-commerce business it doesn't matter where you're selling i proved it you can compete with the biggest brands that you're going to see on tv or see on national advertising it's possible if you know some of the things that we've talked about today. Before we get into the fire round, can you share with us a little bit about SKRP Media and what type of clients you guys like to work with? Yeah. So really, we're working with businesses, advising them on, we talked about earlier, about getting them ready to sell and or if they're at a spot where they're ready to sell, we'll actually help them market the business and take that, that you know, help them find a buyer for their asset. And these are asset sales, first of all. These are, we focus on a niche at sub 10 million for a couple of reasons. One, private equity does typically does and go below $10 million. It's not worth their time because there's a lot of work to sell a business. At the same token, we that's the niche we'll focus on. We'll do with e-commerce or any online digital business. We only deal with digital businesses. So that's what we focus on. But the, the one thing I encourage people to try to, it really should be come to us six months to a year out. If you're thinking, okay, I want to sell. A lot of people come to us when it's like, they're so at that spot, they're so over. They try to sell it and they just want to move on because they don't know, they're, they're having trouble growing back to your question. And there's all these things that they don't know. And I went through all you know, the numbers, all these things. And that's where they've kind of gotten to a spot where however they got there, they, to their credit's awesome, but they can't grow. And that's the stuff to see over and over and over again, because if they were growing, most people would want to continue on. And then eventually that's the stuff that will focus on business owners that are sub 10 nine, which is going to be most of your audience and that either want to grow and scale to get ready to sell. Or they're of- awesome. So Steve, all of our guests, we put them through the fire round. Are you ready? Um, let's go. Let's, I love it. What is your favorite book? Oh, a book called Outwitting the Devil by Napoleon Hill. That's a great one for all your listeners because it's the number one thing in this game, and you guys will attest to this, this right here. Yeah. I had a mentor early on say to me, this is 90% mindset, 10% is mechanics that anybody can learn. And I didn't believe, oh, you're crazy. <laughs> There's all this, you know, there was no way. Yeah, once I get farther down the road, it's like, he's right. He was 100% right. And now that I'm farther down the road and I'm dealing with the business I was trying to sell, it's it's that is the number one thing is mindset. So that book, Outwood of the Devil, will tell, take you through a story where it's an older book. It will shock you because it was written in the nineteen late 1930s. But it'll scare you how much of it's relevant today to what's going on in the world today, let alone what talks about all the, the conversations you're having in your head. And that's the biggest that's the biggest challenge you are all up against myself included. It's, it's, the, it's the thoughts in our head. It's the right mindset. Absolutely. No, I've not read that one. I'm going to add it to my list. It sounds like it's timeless. And so a classic. Very timeless. It's great. It's a great audio book. As well. if you, yeah, I'm huge on, on Audible. What are your hobbies? Hobbies are my wife and I are both runners and we'd love to travel. We were actually traveling the world when this whole thing with COVID happened. <laughs> it just, in 2018, as I said earlier, we were having a really good year. We were traveling quite a bit. So my wife and I love to travel. Uh, we just like being we're fitness and health conscious. So anything that's that related, that's that's what that's what our hobbies are these days. And business, because I love doing what I'm doing. Okay, awesome. What is one thing that you do not miss about working for the man? One thing I don't miss is the politics. 
we all can attest that everything makes our screen crawl. It, it's, it's that way everywhere. And I've changed shop enough early in my career that we, and I, your listeners will, will feel this if they've done this. You're like, okay, it's going to be better over here. I'm going to, I got a new job that's over here and it's going to be different, but it's just a different shade of green. Because <laughs> you think the grass is greener on the other side. Yeah. It's just a different shade. It's all the same. And so that's I'm not saying companies are bad, but we've all been down that road where it just gets to a spot where you lose that passion and fire it. That's just what it is, right? And so you, I could ramble on about that forever. <laughs> so, that sounds, sounds spot on. So last one, what do you think sets apart successful e-commerce entrepreneurs from those who give up, fail, or never get started? Go back to what I just said. It's just mindset. It's really, that's the, that is the number one thing is you're realizing, okay, if you've done your research, you've done it ahead of time, you know that there's, oh, one more thing that kind of ties into this is that people come to me as well saying, I got this idea for product and no one is doing it. And my first comment is, that's not good. <laughs> because that tells you, is there really a need in the market? Like you want to have competition. Now, again, if it's fierce competition, it's going to be harder, but you can still make it work. But make sure that there's at least there's at least some level of need. And it's really comes down to a need. All right. I want to thank you for being a guest on the Firing Command podcast. Steve, if people are interested in working with you in SKRP Media, what's the best way of getting in touch? Yeah, they can go to uh, SKRP Media. And I got a special for your listeners. It's uh, skrpmedia.com slash fire dash dash the man so fire the man fire dash the dash man and uh they'll they'll be just answer a couple of questions i'll give them a free consultation all just to kind of see where they're at a lot of times people will that i talk to in that kind of capacity they're just stuck right now and just for getting a fresh set of eyes from someone like myself i'm farther down the road i could pretty much spot where there's they're stuck right now a lot of it's what i talked about today but i can give them a different perspective and kind of dig into their business because i know when i was at that spot early on hopefully your listeners will appreciate this and i'm sure a lot of them are feeling this way right now is I would get that spot and I would say, if I could only have somebody that would just listen, just li- if I get one person to look behind my covers, because a lot of these coaching programs are like all group stuff and I want to show them, but I'm in a group environment. I don't want to share, I don't lift up the kimono and show them everything. So this is one of the reasons I'm doing this is just to let people know to the secure environment, I'll sign NDAs if they're not, don't really need to, because I can ask questions that are top level enough that I can find out where they're stuck. And that's what guys, so skrpmedia.com slash fire dash the Awesome. And we'll post links to that in the show notes. Steve, want to thank you for being a guest on the podcast and looking forward to staying in touch. Thanks, guys. I really appreciate the opportunity. Hopefully your listeners brought some value. Before you go, we wanted to share a new service that Ken and I have been using called Getita that has made us over $10,000 in Amazon reimbursements. The service requires no monthly subscription and Getita collects a small percentage of the money they recover for you. It takes less than five minutes to set up and works on all Amazon marketplaces. Go to getida.com, G-E-T-I-D-A dot com, and enter promo code FTM400. That's FTM for Firing the Man 400 to get your first $400 in reimbursements commission free. How much money does Amazon owe you?